Hi, everybody. Oh, my God, it's so good to see you all. We're going to, I'm going to, Valerie from Cleveland. Hi. Thank you for joining. Patricia from Seattle. Good morning, Patricia. Thanks for joining us. Alma from Canada. Yue, J-U-E, Yue from China. Somebody from China's on here. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you so much for joining. And oh my God, it's so good to be back with all of you. Happy New Year. I hope you all had a wonderful holiday. And hey, let's make sure that this is a year that where we can do everything that we need to do to ensure a sustainable world, okay? Welcome, welcome, welcome. I wanted to sign on a little early to say hello to some of you. And by the way, um, wherever you're watching from, will you drop your name and where you're joining from in the, in the comments? It would really help us. And maybe some of you are getting started for the first time. So welcome to the Fire Drill Fridays family. And we're building community. That's what we're doing. And we're learning about the climate crisis and taking action to address it. Each one of you can help our movement grow by sharing today's show so your friends and colleagues can join the movement, right? So would you just take a moment now and hit the share button? You know, each time you spread the message and share our show, our movement grows and each single voice joins a powerful choir. You know, the, the more people that understand the risk of the climate crisis, and the risk of inaction and are willing to act, the more our voices will be heard. So I wanted to let you know some really good news. The Yale program on climate change communication has been conducting a major climate opinion survey for the last 14 years. They're the go-to survey. The new survey results just in show that about one in three Americans or 59% of us are either alarmed or concerned about climate change and are becoming more active and supportive of policies to reduce planet warming pollution. This is a big deal because nothing is going to happen unless enough people are aware and taking action, right? So, you know, you may wonder, well, why the big surge in climate concern? More people are talking about it. That's one reason, and hopefully we've contributed to that. But for the most part, it's because it's their lived experience is, is what's weighing in here. You know, a recent Washington poll analysis found that more than 40% of Americans live in a county that saw climate-related disasters in 2021, right? People are starting to actually live it. Our biggest problem right now is that state and federal leaders are doing so little in the face of, of this escalating crisis. The Biden administration started off looking so good on climate, right? But new pipelines have been approved along with drilling in the Gulf of Mexico and the Arctic. And what part of keep it in the ground do these electeds not understand? You know, science says that we're supposed to cut emissions in half by 2030, but emissions went up last year. You know, even in my supposedly environmental state of California, we haven't met our greenhouse gas reduction goals, which were too low to begin with. Governor Newsom, the governor of California, is dragging his feet on his commitment to stop oil and gas drilling near communities by creating a 30 foot hundred, a 32 foot a 302,000 foot health and buffer zone, 3,200. That's a big deal, but he hasn't done it yet. He's promised to do it, but it hasn't happened. And it's important. It'll not only help the planet, but it will help all the communities here that have for decades suffered severe health consequences from the pollution. Listen, my friends, our movement, our democracy and our climate need us to move from concern and alarm to action. We have to do something about our concern. This can be calling your elected officials, both local and federal. Lo local are not to be dismissed. It's really important what happens on a local and state level. Um, it can be demanding that they stop drilling, 
They support legislation to stop drilling, stop fossil fuel subsidies, and finance renewable energy projects. Well, another thing you can do is you can make sure that your money or your city's or schools or unions or churches money is not invested in the fossil fuel industry. Or you can work toward getting your home or apartment or office building switched from gas to electricity in terms of heating. And of course, the electricity has to come from renewable sources. You can participate in protests and nonviolent civil disobedience or hold sit-ins in state capitals. You can get a lot of information on things that you can do. In my book, it's called What, I can, what can I Do? My Path from Climate Despair to Action. What can I do? So I urge you to read it. It's very user-friendly. It's easy. And all the proceeds, by the way, go to Greenpeace. And speaking of, one thing that's really helpful is to join a climate-focused organization. You know, even for me, I've, I've been environ an environmentalist for a long time and my voice is heard. But listen, trust me, when I want to be truly strategic about my actions, I ask Greenpeace for help, right? I don't want to do it on my own. Doing activism in the embrace of a movement instead of as an individual makes all the difference in the world. You get into a lot less bad trouble and you wage more effective strategic good trouble that way. And I know this from, from my own experience. As I see it this year, 2022, it's our job to make sure that the enormous shift in the American public's concern about climate that I just mentioned quickly becomes a, a powerful citizens movement that can hold government and business leaders accountable. You know, don't forget, Next, next fall, well, in some states, June, next November as well, midterm elections are going to determine much of what happens in the coming years. The fight for climate and democracy are joined at the hip, and that's why we have to fight for voting rights. This is really critical to us. Getting the right people elected means refusing to vote for any candidate who takes money from fossil fuels or their lobbyists. It means finding out who the politicians are that take this money. And Fire Drill Fridays is going to help you with that, help identify who's good and who's bad. Next fall, I'll be traveling around the country, going back to weekly Fire Drill Fridays and working with all of you to make sure the right people get elected. It means registering voters, getting them to the polls, even if you have to drive them yourself. And we're going to be talking a lot more about this in the coming months and suggesting ways that you can make a difference. So please hang in there with us. Okay. Today's guests are an example of how our, how our movement is growing and gaining momentum in the halls of some of the world's largest institutions. Catherine Abreu, founder and executive director of Destination Zero, and Romain. Iwal Allen from Oil Change International are here to talk about the launch of the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance, known as BOGA, which happened during last fall's COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. This is the first ever diplomatic alliance dedicated to keeping oil and gas in the ground and a very strategic development. We'll learn exactly what the alliance entails, how it came to be, and how it will help us end the era of fossil fuels. But first, ta-da, let's have some good news, okay? Heavy rains in California have allowed the struggling coho salmon to come back in droves. With more rain between October and December of 2022 than the previous 12 months, the fish are benefiting, laying eggs in nests where babies will hatch and spend most of their young life. They will then swim out to the ocean as adults, later returning to the exact same area to spawn. Fish are being spotted in places they haven't been seen in almost 25 years. This is a massive return for the population, thank God. So, Back to BOGA, 
As I mentioned, the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is the first international coalition of governments aimed at ending oil and gas production. This alliance is positioned to be a major player in the fight against the climate emergency. This initiative, founded by Denmark and Costa Rica, was launched during the UN climate negotiations in Glasgow, Scotland last November, and joined by France, Greenland, Ireland, Sweden, Wales, and Quebec. If you want more history or more information about COP and all the history of it and everything that happened in November, check out last month's Fire Drill Friday episode with Kumi Naidu. Now, notably, the only U.S. entry to get involved in BODA was California, who joined the initiative as a second tier member. The, the second tier status is because while California has taken steps to reduce oil and gas production, it has not yet committed to ending oil and gas drilling, which is a requirement to be a full member of BOGA. So for all the Californians watching, we need to keep pushing to end new leasing for fossil fuel production so we can join as a full-fledged member because, you know, don't forget, California has the fifth largest economy in the world. We're, we're like a whole country here. As you know, science shows that in order to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, we have to immediately end the expansion of global fossil fuel production and then rapidly phase it out altogether. The recent International Energy Agency net zero by 2050 roadmap includes that well it it what the science is saying to us is that staying below one and a half degrees celsius the tipping point that scientists have warned us about means no new oil gas or coal fields as of 2021 what we need to do is it's pretty clear right and yet, despite all we know, the 2021 production gap report shows that governments around the world are planning to produce significantly more than we can afford to burn and stay within that one and a half degree Celsius warming. While a growing number of countries announce goals to reach net zero emissions by 2050, those pledges ignore the simple fact that meeting them requires keeping fossil fuels in the ground, duh. <laughs> we know that true climate leadership requires phasing out oil and gas production and fast. And this is why Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance is so sorely needed. And here to talk about it is Catherine Abreu, founder and executive director of Destination Zero a new organization focused on building community for a fossil-free future. An award-winning campaigner and coalition builder, Catherine has spent 15 years developing creative strategies that put people and community at the heart of climate action. She's been helping to build the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance since the very beginning, imagining a renewed vision of what climate leadership looks like. And then we have Romain Iwalalen is the global policy campaign manager at a, an incredibly important organization called Oil Change International based in Paris. He works to push countries to ban new oil and gas projects and to plan a just and equitable phase out from global fossil fuel production. He's been very active in the creation of Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance which is a group of countries and regions that have committed to ending new oil and gas exploration and to phase out their existing production. Welcome to you both. Welcome to Fire Drill Fridays. Thank you so much for taking time to join us. Hi, Jane. It's so great to be here with you. Hi, Jane. Thanks for having us. To start off, will you give us an overview of what uh, BOGA and how it came to be and what it is? And this is all my questions will be to both of you. All right, well, maybe I can start on that. Okay. Um, so as you know, um, the, the climate crisis that we're in is, is the main driver of this is fossil fuel consumption, right? Burning fossil fuel 
uh, oil, gas, and coal has been 70% of the, the warming that we've been seeing, or 70% of the CO2 responsible for global warming comes from that. Mm -hmm. um, knowing that you would assume that governments would take the measures that are needed to, uh, to rein in the use of fossil fuels globally. And indeed, we've seen a lot of work around the world to, to sort of control the amount of coal that's being used uh, in electricity production in particular. And we're seeing that everywhere. But a big blind spot that we've had over many, many years is gas and oil. Um, there haven't been very successful policies to, uh, to control the use of oil and gas. And in particular, one of the big taboos of the international conversation on climate change was how are we going to uh, enact policies to keep oil and gas in the ground and to make sure that we don't extract more oil and gas than is actually compatible with uh, you know, keeping global warming under 1.5 degrees C, right? And so it's been this sort of weird taboo for years because everyone knew that this needs to be done, this needs to happen, but no one was talking about it. At COP, no one was talking about the fact that we needed an action plan on keeping fossil fuels in the ground. And you, you basically it was sort of this elephant in the room that no one talked about. But over recent years, we've seen a number of countries and regions around the world who are starting to, um, to make the, the kind of commitments that we need from actual climate leaders. Um, and they're saying, how is it coherent for my country or my region to call itself a climate leader if I don't have a plan to phase out the production of fossil fuels that are you know, driving the climate crisis? How is that compatible with the commitments that the countries have made in Paris in 2015 uh, with the Paris Agreement to limit warming to 1.5 degrees C? So there was this, um, you know, this progressive realization basically by a lot of actors that the, the status quo could not continue. And so when countries like Costa Rica and Denmark started making these commitments and saying, we will stop looking for more fossil fuels, we will end uh, exploration, a uh, new exploration for oil and gas, uh, us as civil society were saying, that's great, great news, excellent. Now please come together as a group and push this approach internationally, please, you know, you are the first movers, you are the real leaders, redefining what it is to be a climate leader in the space. So please come together and create this alliance to, you know, push that, that topic uh, to the forefront of the international conversation. And that's exactly what we saw in, in Glasgow at COP26 a few months ago, where the launch of this alliance was actually one of the one of the busiest events at COP26. And for those of you who have ever been to a, to a COP, there's a lot of events, but that one was definitely like the hot ticket uh, at, in Glasgow. And so, yeah, so that's the creation of this alliance is basically a sign that the conversation is shifting and it's no longer a taboo to talk about keeping oil and gas in the ground. And that's a good thing. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you, Wilma. Why is it important that leaders not just focus on reducing fossil fuel demand, but also addressing supply, you know, as in winding down oil production? Yeah, so I mean, that's the question, right? And I think Roman and I and a lot of other people spent a fair amount of time kind of explaining the rationale for that when BOGO launched at COP, because we have had so little of that supply side conversation so far. As Roman mentioned, you know, we get together every year at COPs, we have these large coordinated events where we're talking about confronting the climate crisis as a global community. You would think that those spaces talked about the crux of the problem, right? Talked about the use of fossil fuels, but in fact, for decades, for over 30 years, that conversation has been very avoided in that space. And so, you know, a big part of what we've had to do here is help to um, define for people why it's so important for us to move beyond talking just about demand for fossil fuels and also talking about the production of fossil fuels. And there's really two reasons. Number one, I mean, it's common sense, right? You kind of said this in your opening, Jane when we have a problem we identify the cause of that problem and then we target that cause in order to eliminate the problem we have a problem of climate change the cause is the combustion of fossil fuels it would make a whole lot of sense if our international climate treaties were maybe designed to help us work through our use of fossil fuels we did this with the ozone layer right we 
had a hole in the ozone layer. There were some chemicals causing it, chlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons. And so we developed the Montreal Protocol to regulate the production and the use of those harmful chemicals. And in the 30 years since the, or in the years since the signing of the Montreal Protocol, the um, impact that it's had, the healing of the ozone layer has actually gone a lot quicker than we thought. Um, on that common sense bent, it's also about consistency. So I, I don't know if you followed this, but we saw, you know, on the heels of, of COP26, you know, the Biden administration like showed up in force, 13 cabinet members there on the ground in Glasgow, a whole new bold approach to climate that this administration is claiming. And yet just a few days later, they came back to the US and they opened up over 80 million, million acres of public lands for drilling by oil and gas corporations like Exxon Mobil in the Gulf of Mexico. It was the largest sale of public waters for offshore drilling in US history. And so how do you square that, right? This is what Roman was saying is like, countries are asking themselves, how do we square these really contradictory things that we're doing? And it's when you ask yourself like, okay, so why are leaders doing that? That we get to the second reason that it's so important for us to tackle demand and supply together. And that's because of power, you know? So if we go back to that ozone layer analogy, can you name a company that produces CFCs or HFCs? Dow no. Chemical. But can you name a company that produces oil and gas? Yes. These are household names, right? These are the, until very recently, the fossil fuel industry was the wealthiest, most powerful industry that the world had ever seen. Now it's been eclipsed by tech majors, but it still has huge influence. So it's not by accident that we haven't been talking about this. And I think a big part of why we need to be tackling supply side issues along with demand is so that we are really addressing and confronting the, the grip, the stranglehold that this industry has on a lot of our political decision makers. Thank you so much for making the parallel with the ozone layer, chlorofluorocarbons. It's true, you've got to name the, the, the culprit before you can begin to tackle the problem. And we did in the case of ozone. That's a really good analogy, thank you. Um, you know, this year, 2022, there's an urgency that's at an all time high. I mean, how, how do we define climate leadership in the context of implementation and accountability? Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll hop in. I know Roman has some great ideas on this as well. Okay, so I said just now, like, it's not by accident, right, that we haven't been talking about this, that policymakers have been refusing to address fossil fuel supply until very recently, and that our international climate treaties don't even mention the words, like the Paris Agreement doesn't even say the words, coal, oil, or gas, right? It's, it's not by accident that all of us tend to feel that climate change is our fault, our personal responsibility. Um, can only be fixed if we make better consumer choices, buy an e electric vehicle, put solar panels on our roof. That is a result of decades of well-funded, systematic efforts on the part of fossil fuel industries and, and the politicians in their back pocket um, to convince us that climate change is in our fault and not theirs. And so a big part of what we need to be doing in 2022 is reversing that um, attitude about climate change. Climate change is not a, an individual uh, responsibility is a collective responsibility. It is something that we have to be tackling at, on a whole of society scale um, and in deep cooperation amongst different governments, whether different governments from subnational to national in one country or between governments internationally. So I would say when we're looking at implementation and accountability, a big part of what we have to ask ourselves is, okay, how are we, we've got all these big announcements that countries are making how are we making sure that they're delivering on those promises? Where's the tracking happening? Where's the measuring and the reporting and the verification happening? Are we using our international channels like the UN to make that happen? And domestically, do we have the laws to back it up? Do we have climate governance systems in our countries that are making sure like that whole of society, whole of government approach is applying to this you know, greatest crisis that we as humans have faced? It's what Laden promised and hasn't yet delivered. Yes, Romain? I'm so sorry. I was going to say, I think I totally agree with Kat on this. And also I wanted to, to add a notion of coherence uh, that is for me 
like the key, the central element that you know allows you to distinguish between leaders and people who are pretending to be leaders. Because you have a lot of countries and governments, you know, wanting to appear like climate leaders on the global stage, making nice speeches at COP or uh, you know in front of their parliaments. But then when you look at the content of their actual policies, the question that we need to keep asking is: Are your policies coherent with the commitments you've made? You know at COPs or internationally? And are they coherent with the need that's been clearly identified for decades to phase out the fossil fuel system, right? And then you start digging into that and you see that some countries, you know, that claim to be green leaders in Europe, for instance, will continue funding fossil fuel projects abroad, even though they're, they're saying that fossil fuels are not gonna happen at home. And so that notion of coherence, I'm really saying, okay, if we're going to go all the way towards a fossil free system, we need to have the policies in place at home and abroad uh, to make that happen. And that's how you do, you see, uh, you really distinguish a climate leader. Walk the talk, right? Thank you. What role can activists play in ensuring that a, an initiative like Bogda becomes as strong as possible? Well, I would say the first thing that we need to do as civil society is make it make it grow. We need to convince more and more countries. We need to campaign everywhere for you know oil and gas exploration to end. Because as you said very well in the introduction, um, there is a very clear case now, a very clear scientific case that there's just no atmospheric space for more oil and gas. There's no reason, if we're serious about our climate commitments, to keep looking for more oil and gas around the world. And so we need, you know, we need a civil society to ask that question to our governments around the world. Where is your plan? Where is your plan to, you know, stop producing or stop increasing the production of the fuels that are driving the climate crisis? And how do you plan on being able to join that coalition? So it's up to us now to seize the opportunity of the launch of BOGA and, and go after our governments, nationally, provincially, or regionally, depending on your country, and really ask that question to, to, the, to your elected officials or presidents or prime ministers. Mm -hmm. I think the second thing also is we need to keep that coalition honest. We need to keep them accountable because okay, these are the first movers, these are the leaders uh, in, in this field, but they made a number of commitments. But if you look at the science, some of these commitments are not quite there yet. They said, we will stop the expansion of fossil fuel extraction, but a lot of countries don't plan to phase out their existing production uh, at a rate that's compatible with what science says is necessary. So we need to keep pushing for more. We need to be saying, this is a good step. This is a good development that we, re we really want to congratulate you on that. But this is not enough. The urgency of the crisis um, compels us to do more and to do it faster. Yeah. And I would say the final thing uh, on this, that we, the role that we have to play as civil society is um, we need to make that alliance and that conversation um, relevant to countries that are outside of the global north, outside of the usual Western European suspects or Scandinavia or other countries that are part of, part of this alliance. Mm -hmm. um, we really need to define what this alliance can offer to countries, as you said, very, you know, exactly on point during the introduction, there are some countries that are very dependent on fossil fuels. And we need to, to, to push that alliance to, to create an offer to them. How can they support that transition away from fossil fuels? How can they support uh, diversification of revenues in these countries? And so really they need to expand uh, you know, their, their offer to these countries. And, and we have a role to play as civil society to keep them honest on this and to keep pushing for, for more. Yeah. You know, it's, it's such a big and not yet spoken enough about a uh, problem. There, the petrol states like Russia, like, um, like Abu Dhabi, like Qatar, like, I mean, you know, the countries, there are countries that totally their economy depends on fossil fuel production. So to tell them to stop fossil fuel production would send them into economic failure. They'd become a failed state. So we're going to have to figure out what we, how do we offer um, help to these countries, and some of them are quite wealthy. But you know, what do we? How do we figure out what 
we have to offer the petrol states in yeah. order for them to give up fossil fuels. Totally. And, and and that question, actually, you have to ask it on a few different levels, right? So you ask like, okay, those countries that are currently really dependent on revenues from oil and gas production, um, you know, a majority of, of the services that they're paying for for their citizens comes from oil and gas revenue. So if you remove that source of revenue, you're actually putting a whole bunch of people in danger. You're, you're you know, perhaps putting them in, into the dark, right? Um, or you're or you're maybe jeopardizing their healthcare systems. Um, but if a big part of the answer there is those countries who depend far less on that revenue uh, need to be giving up that production first, right? And it so happens that it's those countries who are least dependent in some in some instances on oil and gas revenue that have the largest plans for expanding oil and gas production, namely the US and Canada. Um, so, you know, between now and 2030, the International Energy Agency just told us there's no need to invest in new oil and gas or fossil fuel production. Um, and yet in the US and Canada, there are huge expansion plans for oil and gas production between now and 2030. The US and Canada, I mean, I'm not going to diminish the fact that there are communities across the US and Canada who do depend on oil and gas production and making a plan for how we transition those communities away from that reliance in a just and fair way is so essential. But on a national scale, the US and Canada can afford to end this production, to stop the expansion now. And so that's part of it. And then the other part of it is like, what about those countries who are sitting on reserves? You know, they're industrializing and they're saying, like in Argentina, we have a whole bunch of shale gas that we can tap into. Why don't we get to do that when the US does? And so that's part of the conversation too, is how do we help countries leapfrog developing fossil fuels as a source of income as they industrialize? And that's where that big offer has to come into play. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have to lead by example here in the United States. It's And California can lead the way. We're the, the mm -hmm. In a good potential leadership position, Let me, why isn't it enough for govern, governments to commit to phase out timelines without also committing to halting new fossil fuel production and exploration? Well, part of the reason for that is um, because we have too much oil and gas in the system right now, very, very frankly. Um, at Oil Change International a few years ago, we published a report that showed that there's already more CO2. Uh, in oil and gas fields that are currently being, you know, uh, extracted or that are, that are really uh, being used, uh, then is compatible with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees C. That is, if we burn all the oil and gas in existing fields, already we're above 1.5 degrees of warming. Mm -hmm. So if we keep adding new fields and, you know, doing more exploration and, and adding new oil and gas fields, the situation will become absolutely dire from the climate point of view, and we will shoot past two, two and a half, maybe three degrees without, um, without critical measures. Um, so extraction, continuing, the continuing extraction and continuing uh, exploration is where you get that lock-in that we always talk about. Because obviously, if you build new infrastructure to extract and transport fossil fuels, you will want, as an oil and gas company, to make money out of it. And the way you make money out of it is by making sure that your infrastructure lasts for 20, 30, 40 years. But we don't have 20, 30, 40 years to tackle this crisis. We have years, maybe, and we're actually very, very late. And so um, it's very key to understand that uh, there's already too much oil and gas in the system. And if we use all of it, we are gonna, we're gonna fail at our climate targets. Another thing that's also important is and the reason why action needs to happen now and not in 2050 on oil and gas extraction is because fossil fuel extraction is also synonymous in with in a lot of places with environmental racism, with oppression, with local pollutions, and you know that needs to end. What are the communities around the world that are the most impacted by continued fossil fuel extraction? They're usually marginalized communities, communities of color women, 
Um, and if you look at, you know, this, it, it's a big debate in California, environmental racism in the context of, um, of oil extraction. But the same dynamics happens around the world. If you look at, for instance, one project, the East African uh, crude oil pipeline or ECOP, that's a massive pipeline that's being uh, promoted by French energy company Total. Um, it will displace up to 100,000 people and it will threaten the livelihoods of millions of people in the region. And why? To serve the energy needs of the global north. And so you run into continued you know, dy dynamics of colonial extraction of racism that needs to end. So that's why we cannot wait 20 or 30 years to phase out fossil fuel production. We need to tackle it right now. Mm -hmm. California is an advisory, an associate member of BOGA. Um, describe the distinction and what the state can do to become a full member and a true leader in facing out fossil fuels. Yes, so there are a few different categories of membership to the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance. Um, there are core members of a number of um, countries in that in that group, some associate members, and there are also friends of BOGA. Um, so the core members of BOGA have committed to ending new concessions, licensing or leasing rounds for oil and gas production and exploration and to set a Paris aligned date for ending oil and gas production and exploration on the territory in which they have jurisdiction. Associate members are countries or subnational jurisdictions like states that have taken some steps toward addressing supply side issues with their climate policies, but haven't yet been able to take that step of saying no new licensing, no new permits for oil and gas production, period. Uh, and so that's that's really what we're waiting on California to do, right? So in October 2021, right before um, COP26, Governor Newsom uh, announced the commitment to, um, as you were talking about in your introduction, establish that 3,200 foot setback for, for oil and gas operations, which has been, you know, that's like just a huge kudos to the communities that have been fighting tooth and nail for that in California for years. Um, equity seeking communities in particular who have who've really done an incredible job um, and congrats on getting that commitment. But as you said, we're not really seeing the administration implement it at this point. They also said, we're gonna phase out oil production no later than 2045. But they didn't really put any specifics around it. And so if, if California is gonna move from that associate member category into the core member category, we need that clear commitment that there will be no new permitting, no new licensing for oil and gas in the state. Um, and we need that, uh, some clarity on that phase out date. Um, you know, I, I wanted to also, if I can, just come in a little bit on, on what Roman was just talking about. Um, I, we've talked, I, I'm sure you've, you've talked about it in previous um, um, conversations as well, Jane. The International Energy Agency released a couple of really groundbreaking reports last year uh, on what it means if we're gonna like tr truly get to net zero by 2050. And what they said was that is, requires no, nothing short than a, total transformation of global energy systems. And I think we did hear a fair amount about the fact that the IEA said that means no new fossil fuels, which was really important to hear them say, because um, they've never said anything like that before. But I don't think it got a lot of coverage that what they also said was it requires a huge investment in renewable energy and clean technologies. And so we're also talking about that, right? Um, Roman was saying, okay, we really need to be addressing the, the extraction of fossil fuels for a myriad of reasons, but I would add one of the other reasons is because of how much it limits our imagination. As a Canadian, I can say, even if I'm not even concerned about the climate impacts of the oil and gas sector in Canada, the fact that it constrains the imagination of what is possible for my country makes it a danger <laughs> because I think Canada has a hard time imagining itself um, as something other than an oil and gas producer, as other than, you know, a country that extracts natural resources and exports them around the world. And we need our governments to be thinking more imaginatively than that. We can't be continuing to fall back on that economy of the past. So I think that's part of what we're talking about here too, is like, how do we free up 
the, the imagination of our governments, the resources of our governments to get to that $3 trillion of investments that the IA says we need in renewable energy to have that large energy transformation around the world. And I can't help but think while you're talking of how important voting is, because for this to happen, for leaders to change the way they think, literally change the way they envision their identity as a leader and as a country, we have to change who the leaders are because we don't have the right ones in place yet, in either in can well anywhere practically. Um, so we also, at the same time that we're fighting to end the fossil fuel era, we're, we have to fight for voting, voting rights here in the United States. It's so critical. Th thank you for that, Kat. I appreciate what you just said. Um, is there a role for a multilateral alliance like BOGA to help member and non-member countries dramatically scale up investments in alternative energy systems? Are they going to be doing that as well? Well, we're definitely going to push them to do that. Uh, and there is definitely a role for them to do that because the commitment they made as you know BOGA members is domestic, right? They say at home, we're going to stop extracting new fossil fuels and we're going to phase out our existing production. Mm -hmm. But as you say, there is a role for these countries, which a lot of them are you know, wealthy countries of the global north to actually, you know, help others do that transition or go through that transition or leapfrog fossil fuels. And what we're seeing is uh, a lot of, you know, a lot of words, but not a lot of action. Um, the G20 countries, so the, the 20 largest economies in the world, still spend almost three times as much subsidizing fossil fuel projects abroad than they do subsidizing renewable energy uh, through their development banks, their credit export credit agencies, and we're seeing the same trend with a lot of multilateral development banks like the, the World Bank and others. So there's still a lot, a lot of public money going towards, uh, you know, building new fossil fuel infra infrastructure around the world. And that money is not going towards funding renewable energy or energy access. And so, yeah, you know, the notion of coherence is once again something that I go back to because it's, it's really striking. <laughs> Um, you have countries that will say, oh, yeah, of course, we will stop extracting oil and gas at home, but are still very reluctant to say, oh, but, you know, we're, we'll also stop funding gas terminals in Russia or pipelines in Africa. And so that's also their responsibility as BOGA members to say, okay, we've done the job at home, but we're going to do it internationally too. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of campaigners in the community pushing you know, for development banks, for large donor countries to actually shift away their public funding away from fossil fuels and towards renewables. Um, so that's, that's the money part. And there's, a, there's also the technical assistance part that you know, then there's a, a whole lot of experience that's been acquired in, in a lot of countries on deploying renewables and that needs to be, to, to be shared. Um, another thing that's also incredibly important, and that's something that Kat mentioned as well, is the notion of a just transition, right? Because a lot of countries already went through, you know, energy transitions. They phased out coal or they phased out economic sectors uh, in the 60s or 70s. For instance, the UK transitioned away from coal mining um, in the 60s and 70s. But if you don't take care of the workers and the affected communities, you know, the communities whose livelihoods depend on fossil fuel extraction. You're also going to create a lot of resistance to change. And that will be entirely understandable. You know, how would you support a number of policies or measures that actually are destroying your, your livelihoods if you don't have support? Mm -hmm. And so what these countries, what BOGA members can do too, is really learn or share their experiences, the best practices when it comes to just transition, how do we take care of our workers in our oil sector or coal sector or other economic sectors that were impacted by the transition and what can we, you know, what are the lessons that can be learned from that? I think that's a key role they could play. But first, first thing they need, they need to do is really be coherent where, about where they put their own money. Mm -hmm. If they stop, if they don't stop funding fossil fuels abroad, they really have a problem with coherence. Um, I have more questions, but I want to know, Maddie, do, do we have audience questions that you could uh, pass us? 
Certainly, we have a lot of really good audience questions for both of you, Roman and Catherine. Um, so this one's for either one of you from Sabine on Facebook. I'm a climate activist, but I don't totally understand how we phase out oil and gas without totally devastating the economy. Do I have to stop driving? Um, this is a really important question. It, it gets back to something that I was talking about earlier, which is this impression that all of us have been given over the last number of decades that climate change is our fault and the way that we take action on it is by making different consumer choices. Um, and so I really want, Sabine, I really want to say to you, you should be able, if you want to, to make different choices for how you move around your community. And it's not up to you to just stop driving and not be able to take yourself to your place of work or take your kids to school. It's up to your government to make it easy for you to get to where you need to go in a sustainable climate safe way. <laughs> And that's really what we're talking about here, right, is designing climate policies that are about putting people at the center of them rather than the interests of profit seeking companies, i.e. fossil fuel companies. Um, and I think we've been we've been seeing the opposite of that for quite a long time that that explains some of the lack of progress on climate change um, that we've seen over the course of the last 30 years. <clears throat> so how we transition away from fossil fuels without totally devastating the economy is we plan to transition away from fossil fuels without totally devastating the economy it's really about planning we have the opportunity to take advantage of so many financial gains that come along with this transition so much job creation that can come along with this transition also the ability to um, make sure that those communities that haven't benefited from previous energy systems, you know, I'm thinking of um, in particular indigenous communities who are often, uh, you know, their rights are often um, stripped away in order to allow fossil fuel, as governments allow fossil fuel companies to come into their traditional territories uh, and extract the, that oil and gas. Um, indigenous communities across the world are now on the forefront of renewable energy projects and, and they have the, the potential, we have the potential here to see those communities gaining wealth and security and safety from this new energy system is, as opposed to really um, being on the losing side of it. And so there are all these positives that we can grasp as long as we take the time to plan. And I think that's actually what Bogue is all about is saying, you know, here are the countries that are that are doing that. They're going to plan for it. They are figuring out how to do it, and they're going to, you know, amongst themselves, figure out how to do it even better. Um, and and that's why we need more and more countries to come into the mix and say, yeah, we're going to do that planning too, instead of just letting the market take care of it and having that transition happen in a totally unplanned way. Thank you, Natty. Do you want to ask another? Yes, we have so many. Um, from Eddie on Facebook, Roman, can you clarify who else are BOGA members? Are there any other states in the US or around the world that are close to becoming members? Yes, I can clarify. Actually, let me open the, the list of members because I never, <laughs> I never actually remember it. Um, so the founding members or the, the champions, if you want, of this alliance are uh, the countries of Denmark and Costa Rica. Um, so they've really been at the forefront of trying to, to set this up. Um, the other full members, as uh, Kat has explained, uh, are so France, my own country, um, Greenland, Ireland, the, the province of Quebec in Canada, Sweden, and Wales. And then you have a second tier of members of this coalition are California, uh, New Zealand, uh, and Portugal. Um, are there other states uh, that are close to becoming members? Um, I hope, I really hope, and that's also our job to make sure that they do. Um, right now, California is the only US state that's, uh, that's a member of this coalition. But there are so many opportunities to engage in particular progressive states in the US in saying, you know, exactly the question I was asking earlier, or I was urging you all to ask your elected officials in the US and elsewhere, which is, 
your governor X in your state, you're you know, positioning yourself as a climate leader. What is your plan to constrain the, fossil, the production of fossil fuels in your state? What is, you know, what are you doing concretely in your, in your state policies to be able to join that alliance? And so we, I think we really have an opportunity to create a movement around, you know, joining BOGA or at least aligning with the standard of leadership that this alliance is trying to create. And not only to improve the lives of people, you know, suffering from fossil fuel extraction in the state, but also to put pressure on the federal government in the U.S. Uh, to actually, you know, get real when it comes to phasing out fossil fuel production. And as Kat said, that's not the trajectory that the Biden administration has taken so far. So there's really a need to create this sort of bottom-up pressure on the states and therefore on the federal government in the U.S. to, to align on that. And so that's what we're going to be doing. And that's what we're going to be, you know, working with our partners in the U.S. and Canada and around the world, really, to try to grow this alliance and really think as BOGA as a momentum seeking uh, initiative right the more the more places commit to ending new permits or new drilling licenses for oil and gas the more normalized this will become you know it will become increasingly harder for the bigger producers um, to to justify you know the status quo to justify just saying oh this is not for us we're, we're going to continue as it, as if nothing was happening in the world and so we really need that sort of grassroots energy, right? To push the, the governments and, uh, and the states to say, this needs to end. The first responsibility, the first step towards um, solving the climate crisis is actually to stop adding fuel to the fire, which is exactly what uh, continued fossil fuel extraction is. So uh, we're really uh, counting on you to, to move as many US states as possible towards Boga. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Catherine, did you want to add something? Oh, no, I think Roman covered that just right. Perfect. And so we will promise you we'll do all we can to step up to the plate of your challenge. Yes, Maddie, definitely. do you want to have one more question from the yeah, audience? Definitely. Um, this question is from Lainey on Facebook for either of you. Um, Catherine mentioned earlier that we need to make sure we're tracking our impact and how we live up to our climate promises. What do you all as advocates for a fossil free future see as the best way to measure progress? Mm. All of the ways all at once is a, is a quick answer to that. Um, so I think it's fair to say that we've been in the climate conversation pretty preoccupied with targets for a long time. Um, so, OK, what's what what's your emissions reduction goal like by 2030 um you know we saw the the big announcement from the us earlier in the year to, to move to um reducing emissions by 50 percent by 2030 um that was big headline news and a lot of the announcements around climate that we've heard have had that kind of big headline target flare at, though it's not that targets aren't necessary they totally are they give us that you know, end goal, they tell us where we're headed, but we can't obsess over targets at the expense of really having our a grip on how we're going to hold true to those promises. So earlier I talked a, about climate governance and legislation, and I think that this is a really big, although kind of unsexy part of the solution here. Um, increasingly those jurisdictions that are serious about delivering on their promises on climate action are putting in place climate legislation and climate governance systems that make sure those targets are set in law, that in law there is a process established to develop plans to meet those targets over time, that that law also contains processes to report back on that progress and a means of redressing when that progress isn't seen. Um, so how do you course correct, right? How do you make sure that you get back on track if you're not on track? Uh, and I think that that can be a really, really helpful way of at the domestic level, making sure that we're delivering on those promises. Internationally, I think we need our system to be less focused on those high headline announcements and more focused on 
okay, let's tell the story of how we're doing this as a community and let's do some big broad planning together. We've talked a lot about energy transition and transformation today. Why don't we use those annual COP meetings where the whole world gets together to talk about how that energy transition is going at home and how we cooperate on an international scale to make sure that it continues. Um, and so I think, I think transforming that international system is a big part of it too. Thanks, Catherine. <clears throat> Maddie, I think, uh, I think we've run out of time for questions, okay? And I want to thank both of you for joining us today, taking time from your busy day. And it's important that we take time to celebrate the steps that we're making while we continue pushing for changes that we know we need to happen. We So anyway, keep up your good work. Thank you so much for what you're doing. And, uh, and thanks for helping us understand what, what it is that you're doing. Okay. Thanks, Jane. As a, theater, so as a theater school nerd from my high school years, I, I also just want to thank you for your incredible activism and, and artistry over the years. Thank you. So as we discussed throughout the show, it's, it's critical that governments across the globe stop contributing to the climate emergency and begin to start working to, to stop it, stop the, the climate crisis. Global powers and major economies have to do their part. You know, my, my home state of California is not only a major oil producer, it's the fifth largest economy in the world with a reputation as an environmental leader. And so this year, one of our goals is going to be to try to make certain that California lives up, lives up to its reputation. You know, last year, California wildfires and heat waves got really bad. They got much more intense. And Governor Newsom leveled up his commitment to move the state beyond oil and gas by announcing a goal to phase out oil drilling by 2045. And he proposed a plan to end new neighborhood drilling projects and joining the Beyond Oil and Gas Alliance as an associate member. These were really important victories on the journey to ending the era of fossil fuels. They, they really speak to the power and tireless efforts of frontline communities fighting for climate justice. But as is becoming increasingly clear, California, like the rest of the world, is facing the very real impacts of climate catastrophe. You know, global leaders like Governor Newsom must embrace the full BOGA platform by committing to no new oil and gas exploration, period. It's painfully simple. So long as Governor Newsom continues to green light new oil and gas drilling, his goal of phasing out California fossil fuels will remain unreachable. So, Firefighters, recognizing that what happens in California influences and impacts the rest of the country. Let's make this year, 2022, the year that California's Governor Newsom takes the action necessary to realize his vision for a fossil-free future. That means halting the expansion of oil and gas sooner than 2045. You know the drill. To make change, we have to take action. So join me in urging Governor Newsom to act now for a fossil fuel free, fossil fuel free future. Go to firedrillfridays.com slash take action. That's our show, my friends. Thank you so much for joining us and being part of, of the change that's gonna happen. Share the word, help our movement grow, keep coming back. It's going to be a powerful year for the climate movement. I can feel it. So I'll see you next time.